What's up? So I was checking out some COVID information on like uh, creating your own face mask and stuff like that. And of course that led to some, you know, chain of links, like some rabbit holes, so to speak. And uh, so I end up on this FDA site that's supposed to be a list of code standards, I think for um, like splash resistant and microbial resistant cloth and stuff like that, like the things that you're going to see in um, a disposable gown for personal protection equipment, everything like that. It's basically FDA based. It's the NFPA.org. And you can see the URL right there if you want to check it out for yourself. That's the link I was given, um, I believe, from the CDC site. And so you come down here, NFPA, um, which I to my knowledge, that stands for National Fire Protection Agency. I could be totally wrong, but um, let's see. That's, yeah, it is. National Fire Protection Association. Okay. Um, they're, they also do the electrical standard for, like, wiring houses and businesses and everything like that. Um, that's where I'm familiar with them from. They basically, most electrical standards are based on, fire resistance they're and safety they're not really based on like so much on what's good for the wire and stuff like that which is kind of interesting but anyway so they also publish the uh the electrical code for at least for the united states and they've done that for over 100 years now so anyway i was scrolling down here and i noticed like i mean granted i'm at like a uh 1280 by 720 resolution so that I can get a one-to-one -one with a 780p screencast recording and I typically uh, prefer to browse and use the computer at this resolution you know it's pretty much like a middle-of-the-road tablet or something as far as I would think you know or maybe like a higher resolution phone um, but anyway when I get down here and I'm scrolling through this stuff like if I want to so let me go here. So this is archived, I'm assuming, down here below. But you can see this header. And this is something that's kind of common to some degree on a lot of sites, we all know. And I get this on mobile, where I think, like, whoa, isn't it supposed to be mobile first? Like, they're going to put all this cruft on my screen. And this is leaning more severe for what I usually see on desktop. So I just wanted to point it out. Um, but yeah, so all this stuff above archive, so this additional information and those links right there are I guess what I need to download but they seem to think that um you know that I I might want to start browsing these huge things right here and this is just I don't know I, you could see and then one of the problems too is like say that I go down here and I'm like okay archive information and I come back up here um, then if I go like right here, if I click in this gutter above the thumb, above the scroll thumb, what that does is that does a page. That's roughly, you know, I'm going to hit it on the keyboard now. Page down, page up, page down, page up. And then if you can see here, page down, page up, it's virtually the same exact thing. But when I do that, I'm down here on this one by itself. And then you can see when I hit page up, now I'm at the top of that. So for one thing, as far as accessibility goes, like just general accessibility, it's skipping documents, you know, and these are supposedly like imperative, you know, and then um, once I click download and download one of the files, uh, it will pop up Chrome or Chromium in particular will, of course, pop up that, you know, downloaded files bar on the bottom, which will effectively shrink this screen real estate even further. So um, that's just, that's basically what I wanted to show. And maybe some UX people out there can get some influence, especially, you know, considering what's going on right now. Um, like, I look at this kind of stuff and I'm like, this stuff should be very accessible and not, and why am I having to agree to uh, privacy policy stuff? You know what I mean? And just by clicking on this, even though I'm in incognito mode, which theoretically shouldn't save any cookies. There's sort of more that goes along to that in general than just saving cookies. So it might be like, oh, you know, some people might think like, oh, I have nothing to lose. I'm going to click I agree and get this to disappear. 
well, what are you agreeing to? You know what I mean? You're agreeing to this entire privacy policy that's click wrapped. And is that saying we have the right to sell out your, your IP address? You know, who knows what it, what it could do. And if they're having to present this type of information, especially within the United States, because this shouldn't really be subject to too much GDPR. I mean, I could understand if people want to go that route because just to keep their site internationally friendly and stuff. But, um, I, I just, I don't get it, you know, um, but basically I'll shut up now, but my whole argument is that this is just, this is not proper accessibility. You know, it's a joke. It's like a toy and I don't see why the NFPA needs to track people or any of that stuff. Like, I think they should just, when I click for this information, they can do this fancy site where it's appropriate and maybe they should test, test at common, uh, device dimensions, pixel dimensions, like all that, because what I can do also, you know, in all fairness is I can come over here and this basically will usually kick something into mobile mode. So if we scroll up here, you can see there's like the hamburger, the so-called hamburger menu. So that kind of like implies that, Hey, we've, we've kicked into like, we've rounded you down to like a more mobile style flow. Um, also pretty common. And so now the menus there, it's sandwiched up in there effectively. And then if I grab the scroll thumb and come down, now you can see this is taking up even more vertical real estate. And if I scroll down here, you can see, and the header as well, more vertical real estate and 100% of the horizontal for both of them, of course. And you come down here and um, we're basically, we're back to, I can't even see the button. Yeah, I'm not even seeing any download buttons. Can I scroll this thing over? That does the menu. And if I do the middle click, my mouse wheel's broken, but if I do the middle click, I can go up and down with it, but I can't go left and right. I'm gonna click in this box to, uh, oh, apparently that's, that's doing this little plus, <laughs> which I would have never known that was there. That's cool that you can actually click out here to do it because I would have never thought to like, or, you know, that's not something that would have come to my mind anytime soon. But if I get in here and get this focus and then push the arrow, oh, okay, there we go. There we go. So I have to do that, expand the section, which there's just that, okay, show more. To be fair, this little show more is there. And then what am I getting? Oh, I lost it. It took me, which people familiar with these janky sites know how those like expansion things can throw off the browsers and stuff. So, and it's gone, <laughs> like, what? Let's go back full. Um, try that one last time. So there they are now in the full mode, you can see them again. So the best thing is obviously just to drag this little scroll thumb. Um, that is my, probably one of my least go-tos for Navigating, I'll usually try out that middle click if I get, you know, some alleyways and stuff. And then I'll probably just do a scroll up, scroll down, because on a typical page, I know that that's going to be, you know, usually if, it, if we had a full page scroll up, scroll down, you scroll page down and you end up with the last line or three at the top of your screen. And, uh, the, you know, the, the one to three lines of text or imagery or whatever that was down here, We'll end up up here so that you can kind of like catch that with your eye and then you'd start reading about right here and continue down and you don't lose information like that but this method loses information and one other thing that i noticed that occasionally some ux people will do is they'll come in and they'll try and programmatically take control with javascript uh or i suppose even WebAssembly these days but they'll come in here and programmatically try and take control of this scroll bar slack does that horrible horrible. I don't want to take up a bunch of time and go into Slack and show you how horrible it is, but just use a desktop. Um, if you want to match me exactly, go to 1280 by 720 for your desktop dimensions. And which admittedly the 720 is a uh, lower screen real estate. They recommend at least 768. So 1024 by 768, I think is still considered the rough minimum, but I'm going to hit F11 and go full screen to kind of show you like if I do even uh, 
last time I count, I think this is like roughly 30 to 40 something pixels, probably depending on the resolution. Don't quote me on that. And then you can see there's about another 30 or so pixels and then maybe 10. I don't know. So you can see that there's, we can kind of squeeze that extra real estate out versus like somebody who's in a 768 uh, vertical pixel mode. They would probably have like, I would imagine like this little, at least this minimal header and like some star bar, whether it's at the top or bottom, maybe like typically it's probably fairly common. Um, but if I hit F11, I'm, I'm regaining that real estate for this browser client window. So it's kind of like saying, you know, this is probably what it would be like, somewhat what it would be like with the uh, like 768 pixel mode. But you don't know for sure because, of course, because um, there's all sorts of factors. There's at least a handful of factors that go into that. They might be literally testing your the dimensions of the desktop or something and so they might not kick into that mode even though you're giving it that more real estate unless it's you know reported that your desktop pixels or whatever but anyway uh ux front end ui people please take note this is one of the things like a lot of frameworks a lot of those popular frameworks they are one trick ponies so to speak the way i see them like react is designed by and for facebook you know, so for some reasons, they feel that that's profitable. First and foremost, a corporation in the United States, at least, is required by law to pit profit um, above everything else that they have to take profit. Um, don't take my word for it. Look that up. And then there are several other things that they're supposed to consider as well, you know, but so that's just showing you that, you know, that's the number one driver for Facebook to use React. I don't have any real supporting evidence beyond that um, I can try and find some and provide some but that's just the gist in general I'm not trying to single out Facebook on that you know I realize there's a lot of benefits and stuff to you know there's trade-offs for everything but um these frameworks are that are guilty of a lot of this stuff and uh, on the topic of react being made by Facebook that's sort of an exception because a lot of these frameworks are made by individuals for the most part with community contributions you know and a few people maybe that might have commit access and stuff like that but for the most part it's done by an individual and and it definitely at least probably started and getting some traction mostly by a single individual and they don't always you know they have good intentions i think but they don't always usually have the best architecture skills and a framework is i mean that's architecture you're you're grafting in architecture and you're standing on that architecture. So that becomes a foundation for, you know, some or all of your application, excuse me. And so that, uh, I used to work in construction. I used to swing a hammer and nail houses together and stuff like that. So I'm familiar with how critical it was to plumb those walls as precisely as possible to look at bows and crowns and stuff in the, the two by four material and take all of that into consideration when erecting these structures because one one centimeter not, not even a centimeter like a millimeter even um a sixteenth of an inch or something like that i mean a sixteenth of an inch is fairly close in that context but it's still you want to be oftentimes we would say um a, like a six you know and one sixteenth heavy and that's the way we would describe if the line was right in between the 16th line. So uh, in electrical, we a half inch was considered spot on. You know, if you measure a ceiling fan and it's a half inch off in both directions, whatever, you know, it's eight to 10 feet in the air or whatever, nobody's gonna probably notice that and it's gonna look centered. Um, but like I was saying in framing and rough and framing and stuff, you really wanna get that line like that precise and stuff. and like even when we were getting cuts, if somebody would, we'd make sure and use the same brand of tape measure, not even the same brand, the same model. If you take a, uh, a Stanley Fat Max tape measure, which is one of the most popular tape measures in construction, I, that was the one I used most of the time. Um, I did use some cheap ones and alternates here and there, but most of the time I use that Stanley Fat Max. And if you take the Stanley, oh, what do they call it? Like a click lock or whatever, the old school Stanley, those big silver tape measures that 
maybe you think of as like the epitome of like an American looking tape measure or something. Those are like the two, they're both by the same brand. They've both been around for decades now. And if you take them, I'm pretty sure the Fat Max has been around for decades, plural. If not, it's just about been around decades, plural. It's, it's, I've been using one for almost 20 years. Uh, but yeah, if you take those, they'll be a 16th off. If I remember correctly, measure the same line, make a crow's foot mark, they'll be a 16th off. So that was something we had to take into consideration even was that whether or not somebody was doing that. But anyway, all that was to say that, you know, that's how much in building construction, we were worried about these little tiny details like this. And if, of course, if you picture an angle, like picture how small that angle is in the corner, at some point it comes to what we call a, like an infinitesimal point, right? But then at the farthest point of the angle, think of how far apart they are. And they started with just that one little gap right after that point, you know, so they very quickly veer apart from each other at just uh, to put it simply, maybe at like an exponential variance or something. And don't quote me on that. That's not like a scientific phrase or anything. That's just my way of trying to put it with what vocabulary I'm working with right now. Um, so anyway, all this stuff matters, you know, all these, all these measurements matter and everything. And I approach what some would call software engineering. I feel that's a very delicate term to me because I feel if we're going to call ourselves software engineers, um, which I think we should strive to achieve the level of, uh, for bad vocabulary in my head right now, I'm just tired been doing a lot of various research today but uh yeah if we're gonna try we should strive to make that claim and if we're gonna make that claim we need to strive to be thoughtful engineers about how we're doing things and we need to think about the future we need to think about just all sorts of stuff so that there's the least path of resistance in doing this and you know, maybe ditch the frameworks. Maybe those aren't right. Maybe come up with appropriate. Maybe if somebody started combining a catalog of appropriate practices, like in even a wiki format, and people could go in and piddle away at that. And I don't know, you know, anyway, thanks a lot for listening.